So welcome to the Arctic Environmental Humanities Symposium. We're thrilled to have a round table today. This is a, a, a series that Michael Bravo from Cambridge University and myself, Adriana Kirchin from Boston University have been running for the last year. We started during the lockdown and, and it's been a real source of um, inspiration for many of us to get together circumpolar style uh, virtually. Uh, without further ado then, um, curating the Arctic, Northern Museums and decolonization. We're thrilled to have three speakers today and I'll just briefly tell you who they are alphabetically. Um, our first speaker is Sven Hawkinson, who is Associate Professor of Anthropology at the University of Washington, who is also curator of Native American Anthropology at the Burke Museum of Natural History and Culture at the University of Washington and was formerly the director of the Alutik Museum in Kodiak Island, where he was born and raised. Our second speaker is Genevieve Lemoyne, who is a curator at the Arctic Museum at Bowdoin College in Maine. And our third speaker is Kirstine A.B. Muller, who is a PhD fellow at the Greenland National Museum and Archives. And um, we'll, we'll leap right in and ask um, and welcome Sven Hawkinson. Well, first, Koyana, um, I just want to acknowledge that I'm calling in from the uh, lands of the Coast Salish people here um, based out of Seattle, Washington, um, where I'm currently at. Um, so I just wanted to, uh, I guess, just share a little bit about um, my work with museums. And so I've had the privilege to actually, and I went back and looked at, I've been working in museums for over 30 years now and working with museums, starting with the Cultural Center in Kodiak, and then working into you know, various museums, um, with all the Field Museum in Chicago, the Peabody Museum at Harvard, and then the um, NMA, um, not NMA, uh, Museum of Natural History in Washington. Um, and then being the director of the Lutic Museum, now the curator of the, at the Burke Museum. So in, in that time period, I've had the privilege to, to research and look at collections around the world and thinking about what do museums mean and how can indigenous communities use or work with communities, work with museums in order to, to take back knowledge that was literally erased from their living knowledge. And how do we do that? What are the practices and what, what can we do once we've done that moving forward? And I'm just gonna give you an example of what I did working with an Anyak, um, and let me pull up the uh, shared screen. So this traditional Anyak, these um, traditional boats uh, disappeared from Kodiak in the 1860s, or by the 1840s, they weren't being made, but they, they stopped being used and documented by the 1860s. And over the years, I ran into models. My first experience was seeing this in 1991 at the, um, um, MAE, Museum of Anthrop Anthropology and Ethnography in St. Petersburg um, when I was an undergraduate student. And I saw this and I didn't believe it was ours. I didn't believe that we had open boats because they didn't exist on Kodiak. But while I was a director of the Lutic Museum, I ran into 13 of these models. And then um, I didn't have time to actually pursue that. But when I started my work here at the University of Washington, I wanted to explore these, this vessel. And so what I did is um, through my position as curator, I used the one model, they have one of 13, well, one of 15 models now. Um, I reverse engineered this, sketched it out, and, and then I went to the village of Akyak and in the summer of 2014, um, we made 13 model Anyaks. And one of the things that is important is I learned from Alfred Nomoff about how to make traditional kayaks with no glue, no nails, since that's what we practiced. Um, so this is the first time, you know, since the 1840s, these vessels have been made. And then from there, the summer, um, Mitch, that summer in 2014, Mitch Simeonov said, well, why don't we make a full-size one? And I had no idea what I was doing, but I'm like, okay, let's figure it out. And at the Burke Museum, I spent that year researching on open boats, um, using my time as a curator, um, and then working with um, community members. And and in that time, we ended up um, making a frame in 2015. And I did the same thing working with the community of Akiak, where in one week, 
um, we have a cultural week where we go down to the southern end of Kodiak and work with the community there. And we made a frame, um, a full size frame on Yacht um, based on materials from both off the beach and from Kodiak itself. So we were able to go from a model to a full size one. And then in the summer of 2016, we finished it. We wrapped it with um, a fabric, airplane fabric, and then painted with buoy paint um, to keep it, um, you know, have it last longer than using traditional skins. But what we learned in that process um, was how to handle these open boats. And this knowledge had completely disappeared. Um, for example, when we first got into this vessel here, this Anyak, we rolled because we didn't put enough ballast in there. We need to put about 300 pounds of ballast in order for it to work right. And that was a quick lesson we learned. And moving forward, um, now that we brought this piece back into a living knowledge, into this, into our living consciousness, how do we work with it? What do we do? So I think another important thing is. Um, working with those who have actually been taught traditionally um, how to make traditional vessels. And Alfred Nomov here um, standing um, was teaching us how to make kayaks and he made one for the new Burke. Um, and what was important about this, this experience is taking knowledge that's embodied in a museum piece that had been erased from living knowledge and finding ways to put it back into a living context. So it's, um, we're able to understand it and also start using it again. And over the last eight years working at the Burke and especially in the last four years um, where we redesigned and built an entirely new museum um, where we created an entirely new gallery and working with my colleague, Holly Barker, one of the things that was important is how do we put community voices first not curators, not other outsides as experts. And that meant us stepping back and listening to what the communities wanted us to share with the public. So we started that process and that's an ongoing thing. And we have a new gallery that actually engages with um, communities so that we are sharing their knowledge. For example, the Coast Salish shovel nose canoe, which is on display, um, uh, these Coast Salish carvers, um, Tyson and um, Keith, Tyson and Keith here made this Coast Salish uh, shovel nose canoe, river canoe for us, uh, for our gallery. And one of the things when we commissioned them to make it um, is they wanted to use it. So they took it out fishing. Um, another project that we're working on is Coast Salish hunting canoe. Um, and that's working with George Swanasent and making canoes that were used for hunting, but also giving it, uh, giving communities our communities, UW students, access to be able to use this canoe um, through the boathouse. And again, it's having one on exhibit, but also putting them into a living context into our communities. Um, so we did, we're, do, we're doing that now through the Burke um, and through UW. But I mean, these are ongoing practices that are seeming to work. I mean, it's, it's a challenge because um, how do we engage with communities that have been disassociated from their material cultures and then how do we reassociate them, but also how do we start to understand them and respect and honor who these, um, honor these cultural pieces, but honor the people from where they come. And I'm gonna end this slide on, um, we wanted to address these issues of how do you decolonize things, but how do you actually acknowledge these challenges of colonialism and how do we move forward? And so this is something that you, when you come into the new Burke, you'll be introduced to. The, and we acknowledge these violent legacies of colonialism. I'm not going to read this, but um, I want to um, put that out there of how do we acknowledge it and then how do we find paths forward? And one of the paths forward is how do we reintroduce this knowledge to the communities in a way that they can engage with it um, on their terms and in their ways? Um, I, again, I want to thank you for giving me a few minutes to be able to share the work I've been doing for the last um, uh, eight years. Thank you. Thank you so much. So um, our next speaker is Jenny Lemoyne. Thank you, Adriana. So um, I also will share some slides in a minute. I want to acknowledge that Bowdoin College is located on the lands of the Wabanaki, the people of the Dawnland who have been 
uh, in Maine, caring for Maine for untold generations. And we're, um, our museum does not hold material directly related to their culture, but we acknowledge the importance of their, their role in our community. Um, I thought I will share my screen as well, and I will give you um, a bit of background our, uh, on our museum. So here I am, the, our full name of our museum is the Peary McMillan Arctic Museum and Arctic Studies Center at Bowdoin College. Um, and this is a picture from the opening of the museum in 1967, it's been here since then. And the gentleman on the left there is Donald McMillan. He's also here on the right with Robert Peary. These are the two white explorers who the museum is named for. They're both alumni of Bowdoin College. Um, Despite the name of the museum, our foundational collection is Macmillan's. We have um, some key Peary related materials in the museum. Um, in particular, here's the, the two of them, Peary and Macmillan in the field in the early part of the 20th century in Northern Greenland. Um, one of the key objects is directly related to Robert Peary and it's this sledge, it's called the Hubbard sledge. It's one of five that were said to have been at the North Pole. It was built by an African-American, Matthew Henson, who worked with Peary. And he built it entirely using Inuit technology and Inuit skills that he had learned from the Inuit that he worked with. Here's some of them here um, in Northern Greenland. Uh, and the contribution of these, these four men in particular, but also really the whole rest of the community in the northern in northern Greenland to Macmillan's work and Peary's work is um, irreplaceable. They could not, neither of them could have done the work that they they did without the skills and the knowledge and the dedicated cooperation and work that these people provided. Um, Henson as an African-American is a remarkable example of that because he was so well integrated into the community. Um, Macmillan worked there though for many, many years and was also very, very integrated into the community in surprising ways. Um, our collection is very much, because it is based around Macmillan, it's very much a 20th century collection. Uh, it, this sets us apart from the big Arctic collections in other uh, big museums in the Southern, you know, in the United States, apart from Alaska, you know, the AMNH, the Field Museum, Smithsonian, all those places, places are holdings of what you would consider classic anthropological ethnographic material are relatively small. What we do have is a remarkable systematic collection of photographs and motion picture films, along with journals, and then in some cases, the objects associated with them that document Macmillan's interactions with Inuit in Labrador, in Greenland, particularly Northern Greenland and Baffin Island. Um, Macmillan visited these same communities again and again between 1908 when he first went north with Peary and 1954 on his last expedition. So that's, you know, five decades of work in these communities taking thousands and thousands of photographs and many hours of motion picture film. Um, they, they really form the most important part of our collection. It's a great, an amazing visual archive of these communities. Of course, it's here in Maine, it's not in the North. And so a great deal of our work over the last 30 or 40 years has been trying to um, continue with, reestablish in some cases, connections with those communities and work to get them access to the materials that we have in our collection. Um, just, this is just an example of, this is Macmillan's, one of Macmillan's motion picture camera films, an Aithley uh, camera that he used to do field photography uh, in the 1920s. And the kind of photography that he was doing, documenting really everyday life. Um, he was well integrated enough into the communities that people didn't, seemed to pay that much attention to him and his camera when he was around so he could just photograph people as they went about things. A lot of the photographs are not necessarily posed, although there are portraits and there are you know, group shots and family shots and things like that. Um, 
we have begun working, well, we started actually in the 1980s to work to try and get this material back to the communities. So we've been involved in a large number of uh, projects to bring photographs back to communities, to work with elders, to um, identify people in the photographs where they're not identified. Um, Macmillan was particularly early in his career. He was really good about writing down who was in each photograph. So lots and lots of them are very well identified. And because of the journals and things like that, we have great context about individuals and families and activities and things like that. Um, but there are inevitably there are some that are not identified. So we've worked with that. And we have in, in each case of these projects in Labrador, in Greenland, in Baffin Island, we have then deposited the photographs with local archives and museums, along with transcripts of interviews and things like that, so that people have access to those materials in their communities. A lot of this work took place before, um, before the photographs were digitized and made available on the internet. Um, now, of course, particularly thanks to COVID, we have had the opportunity to put many thousands of photographs on our website for people to search and look at themselves. But of course, in a lot of these Northern communities, there's still bandwidth issues, so they can't necessarily access them with the ease that people in the South can. So that's a, a problem that we're uh, still working with. Um, we still have a lot of work left to be done with the photographs. Um, there's, there's ways of connecting them with the objects. So just to give you one quick example, oops, go back. Um, in 2001, I had been working with elders in Kanak in Greenland in 1999. And in 2001, we brought two elders, here we are, Mathangwak and Velika Jensen down here and actually to New York to the American Museum to look at collections with Navarana Sorensen who was, um, Alika's sister, but also our translator. Uh, and so we worked with our collections. We looked at photographs, photographs of their families and things like that. Here they are standing on Donald McMillan's schooner Bowden, which Balika remembered coming to the community when she was a small child. And so she was very happy to be back and visiting it. Um, among the photographs are these two people, Kaviak and Amanalek, who are Balika and, sorry, Navarana's parents. Um, and so it's always nice to get that kind of context and to hear stories about, about the families, of course. Um, and then as we were looking through the collections, just showing them the kinds of things we had, we opened you know, the many drawers in the collections room and there was this beautiful ivory necklace carved from a single piece of ivory. And Balika and Navarana both immediately recognized it as their father's work. Um, for us, it had just been an anonymous, because Macmillan, while he documented his photographs, didn't document his objects very well. So we, to, to us, we knew it was, um, had been carved in Northern Greenland, but we didn't know by who. Um, and they immediately recognized it as his. So we were able to identify that, attach, reattach his name uh, back to this amazing piece of work. Um, so these photograph uh, projects have been, have been very valuable and it's nice to have everyone to have the materials back in the communities as much as possible. Um, there still remains a lot to be done. We also just finished within week, weeks ago, finished a huge multi-decade project to, to conserve and digitize the motion picture film, which was much more difficult to work with than the, the photographs. And so now we're working on ways to get that back to the communities. Um, of course, with the bandits, bandwidth issues, even here, streaming many hours of motion picture film is challenging, but we do have some of the short edited films from the 20s available on our website. Um, and there was one more recent film that we have up there. And I encourage you, if you go to our website and look through our collections and our motion picture film, you'll find a beautiful short film that was made uh, about 10 years ago by Mikai Utava from Pond Inlet. This was part of a project. Um, Anne Henshaw had been working with our photographs uh, in Pond and also in Cape Dorset. Um, and she raised money. So Mackay came here and worked with the motion picture film. Um, the grant paid for a movie producer, a film producer to work with her. And she created a short film, a lovely short film using Macmillan's footage from the 1940s and 1950s. It's called, 
I apologize for the pronunciation, Tauten Garineria, the way I picture it. And it's, it's a lovely presentation of Macmillan's film um, by a descendant of the people who appears in the film. And it's something that we never could have done ourselves. And it's, it's really, I think one of the nicest projects that we've worked on. It was very interesting also to see all the work that Sven has been doing with boats because our most recent project also involved reconstructions of uh, watercraft. So this is Noah Nakasak. He's the kayak revitalization lead for the Nunatsiavut government's kayak project um, in Labrador. And we worked with him. We have in our collection here, you can see at the top of this image, we have a, a kayak from Nunatsiavut that was collected in 1891. It's one of the one of the most valuable ethnographic historic objects in our collection. Um, and so Noah came here, worked with a local kayak builder, Fred Randall, and they created this replica of the frame of this 1891 kayak, which was an amazing experience for all of us. Um, Fred had built many replicas, but primarily of Greenland kayak. Noah had built kayaks, but not historic replicas. And so they had a great time working together to construct this one. And we now have, we have had since this took place in February of 2020, uh, we've had the funding to go back in the summer, hopefully, and work in Nain, in the community of Nain to build uh, not an exact replica, but a, a, a historic style Hyatt up there with, with Noah as well, once COVID lets us travel there again. Um, and so that's been, that's been a really productive uh, project. And I encourage you um, to look, if you look at the, our, the exhibit, the Hyatt exhibit on our webpage, there's some great media there, uh, Noah talking about the work describing the Hayek and um, talking about the construction of it. So um, that's a project that's in process in a way, but it's been really, really valuable um, and is uh, hopefully will expand to, to more work uh, with the community in Maine. And I'll just um, mention briefly our newest initiative, which is just getting off the ground now. We have, as I've talked about, a, a huge photo archive, but it's all photographs taken by white men. Um, and we've been given a very generous gift by a donor of, of money to purchase for our permanent collection, contemporary photography by indigenous photographers. And we will be um, working with a, a Indigenous curator to curate the initial exhibit that comes out of that collection and that curator will actually be guiding us in our, our purchasing of those first images. So we're finally able to turn our, to modernize in many ways our photo, um, our photo archive and photo collection and to bring more directly Indigenous voices into that collection. Um, we face a lot of hurdles in work like this because we are so far away from the communities where the material uh, that we hold is represented. Um, it's, it's great working with the North and I have to say, you know, being able to do things on Zoom and remotely these days has helped. Um, it, it's been frustrating not to be able to go directly to the communities, but this is work that we really, is the most important work that we do as a museum is, is getting our collection back and getting people to work with our collection from the communities. 